Virginia parents continue making waves as they stand up to the ACLU in Hanover and expose policies in Harrisonburg that allow schools to deceive parents. Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, with our president, Victoria Cobb. You know, I've been seeing this trend that's cropping up again lately about people having these exotic comfort pets. And what started it all this time around was a while back there was news about an alligator, this huge alligator being walked through a public water park in Philadelphia. And then it turned out it was someone's comfort pet. And it just kind of remembered me of that story we saw a few years back when this comfort peacock got banned off the airport out of the they wouldn't let the person take their comfort peacock on the air the um, airplane and then all the airlines had to come up with guidelines for what is a comfort pet and this just got me thinking in a lot of different directions first of all I was kind of thinking this does seem symptomatic of a culture that is really all about me you know it's kind of about what are my needs it's not about the people around me or even about the animal's needs, you know. Um, but on a fun note, I thought I would ask you, Victoria, if if you didn't have any boundaries, no no holds bar, um, what what animal would you choose for your comfort pet? All right, I, I got I gotta say a few things first. <clears throat> the peacock thing. I'm still wondering, like, if you put that thing on an airplane, like, how big is it? Like, with feathers out, it needs a seat, or if with feathers in, because they're dramatically different sizes. But side I point, I think it gets its own seat. Like, that's insane. But anyway, okay, that's first point. Second point, I just have to comment on your point about what does this say about our culture first? Because you know, when kids are little, they have blankies and they carry them around, or a pacifier, and we train them. Out of that. Why? Because you grow into adulthood and you have to become independent and you can't care. But, you know, if we're going to have pets, we ought to just leave something much less obtrusive, like let people keep their blankies till they're adults. Because seriously, (laughs) that's that's like a lot less intrusive than an alligator walking down the thing. (laughs) Okay, and then back to your actual question. Um, Yeah, I'm just a dog person. There's like no other animal that I like half as much as dogs so it's it's got to be a dog although it's interesting my my kids have had friends that have hedgehogs and I didn't know that was a pet but like they talk about like how great the hedgehogs are so they're very unique pets that I guess could be comforting okay to people. Victoria I don't know if your dog Bo counts as a comfort pet the last time I heard he was eating your Oreos and you were yelling about it so that's yes. not comforting <laughs> he's very soft very fuzzy very wonderful and yeah a little therapeutic when you've had a bad day he's but, still ther- therapeutic. but yes guard the food so yeah that's the, and and you know um the bigger he gets the less he's gonna like you know fit on an airplane seat so he's still cuddly even though he eats your <laughs> yes, cookies <correct. laughs> Catherine, do your guinea pigs count 100 percent guinea pigs uh as much as i love dogs and would love to own one one day um, guinea pigs are just perfect because um, they're small. They're small, and like you know, you don't have to be like, oh, I gotta go home and let my dog out. <laughs> no, you have your guinea pigs in their cage, just doing their thing. And then you know, I this wouldn't be good for a guinea pig, but since you were saying like no holds bar, you don't care about anything but yourself. They you back up small. They're easy to take with you places. <laughs> they would Can be you terrified. Actually, cuddle with those things. Yeah. <laughs> All right. When I've had a bad day, Richard brings me a guinea pig. (laughs) (laughs) They say petting things. You know, they have the dogs that do go into, like, elder homes or places where, I mean, I think there is something to just the calming nature of it. But that's why I don't understand an alligator. There's no petting of an alligator. I I just, that doesn't even make sense. And I just can't help thinking one day that alligator scenario is not going to end in comfort. But anyway, (laughs) (laughs) moving on. Well, getting into today's topic, I wanted to start out with some good news, and that is we continue to see parents in Virginia speaking up and leading the way for the rest of the nation. Let's just start by talking about what happened recently in Hanover County. For months now, maybe even more than a year, I think, the school board there has been under this constant, unrelenting pressure from LGBTQ activists, the ACLU, to adopt this radical policy originally developed by the Northam administration, of course, that would have completely cut parents out of the process when it comes to these transgender issues being navigated to school. So it would have opened up female bathrooms as well as locker rooms to biological males, for example, identifying as female, uh, without any really any questions being able to be asked or any common sense protections. 
Now, let me just say a lot of boards would have totally capitulated after months and months of this pressure. But here's the deal. That did not happen in Hanover. The board stayed strong on keeping the the parental protections because the moms, dads, concerned citizens, especially from our Speak Up Hanover team and other parent groups, they did not give up and go home. They stuck at it for month after month. They gave up their Tuesday evenings so they could go to these school boards and sit there and hold a Protect Every Kid sign and communicate their support to stay strong for parental rights. And, of course, also the safety of our young girls in the bathrooms. So that's kind of a real quick summary. But, Victoria, what's your take on all of this? Yeah, it's been really kind of interesting because we've actually gotten to see both sides of the coin here in two different communities. So, in you know, in Hanover, we get to see what happens when parents are proactive and actually preventative. They're ahead of the game. But then you've got Harrisonburg that we're actually seeing parents have to try to clean up the mess that happens when they create bad policy in the first place. So I guess let's just start with Hanover because we're talking about that. I think this was a major demonstration of the power of parents when they actually speak up and show up. You know, they really did get to see the fruit of their labors with this majority vote on the school board. And they won votes actually from both sides of the political aisle if you can say that. And, you know, they finalized a policy that actually does retain those strong protections for both parental rights and for the safety and privacy rights of the kids. So the big thing is for a school board to actually buck the ACLU is a big deal. That doesn't, unfortunately, they cower to them a lot. And so I think that's really encouraging. So just to mention a few things that this new policy does, just so everybody's kind of clear on what happened with this policy. So before a male or female can enter the actual bathroom of a gender that is not actually theirs. That's how we would say it. You know, they, they enter an opposite sex bathroom. They would have to actually, with their parents, so first of all, you got parents involved, they'd have to, with their parents, do an official request, and there has to be some actual support behind it, supporting documentation, something from a doctor, a counselor, a therapist, something that says this is official and they we're going through this, and there have to be, um, you know, just these kind of backup items, and the school board gets to kind of look at the situation case by case which I think is important. Um, But in other words, it involves the parents and it's going to prevent the situations where um, males can enter vulnerable female spaces just on a whim because they want to, which we've seen is a problem. Yeah, thank you. That was a great summary. Um, I think the fact that it got bipartisan support, as you were saying, demonstrates they were trying hard to be reasonable here, to listen to people, take a common sense approach you know, as opposed to doing something extreme and radical that only reflects um, some people uh, that are just bringing a lot of complaints to the board. And, you know, they sought something that was reasonable. And so, you know, considering how we started out the show with peacocks and airplanes, common sense is refreshing to see. Um, But seriously, it is what's encouraging here uh, is that the board was trying to navigate a pretty complicated legal landscape. You know, we've talked about before the Grimm Gloucester case, uh, Grimm versus Gloucester that went to the the Supreme Court and really forced the Gloucester schools to um, open up their bathrooms. Um, So that's going on. They have that precedent. And then you mentioned the ACLU legal threats. So the Hanover School Board actually, in the face of all that pressure, listened and responded to parents, unlike we've been seeing in other places like Loudoun and other school districts that have shown a lot of disdain. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we've got parents facing almost the exact opposite situation in Harrisonburg right now, where that school system did allow itself to be pressured into the bad policy. So they have bad policy. And I think we mentioned this on a recent show about how there are actually six very brave parents and educators that are just blowing the whistle in that community through a lawsuit. So they're coming at them legally against this bad policy. Let's just listen to one of those teachers who is speaking in a CBN interview about her concerns. Middle school teacher Deb Figliola is one of those suing the district. We are putting kids in the middle of unknown territory. The policy in question requires teachers to ask students which name and pronoun is preferred and teachers must use it. A guidance counselor is to be notified if the student's choice is different from their biological sex, although school officials are forbidden to tell parents. Teachers were not to speak to parents at all uh, in any way, shape, or form, not even to refer to the new name that the student was using. You know, when you listen to someone like this very courageous teacher that has gone out publicly and talked about what's happening and how this policy basically instructs teachers to hide things for parents, 
um, you realize now we have parents and teachers fighting for their rights through a lawsuit in that city. And where is help people understand where Harrisonburg is? Yeah, it's out in the valley. It's kind of it's actually a pretty rural area of Virginia, other than there's a university there that's been driving a lot of the politics. So that kind of brings home, you know, you're not necessarily safe just because you live in a more rural area. And what's interesting is this lawsuit revolves around a very radical transgender issue policy, very similar to what they were trying to pressure the Hanover School Board to adopt originally. But unfortunately, the Harrisonburg schools have taken the opposite course and allowed themselves to be pressured into this. And now this is what the parents are dealing with. Thanks for joining us for Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. If you're enjoying the show, help us encourage others to speak up by giving us a five-star review and sharing it with friends. Thanks for listening. Now, if you read the lawsuit filed by the Alliance Defending Freedom on behalf of these parents and teachers in Harrisonburg, it's actually very alarming. I just want to mention one of the many concerns outlined in this lawsuit. For example, the Harrisonburg schools have implemented this strategy. There's an actual example of it in the lawsuit called Gender Transition Action Plan, that basically puts the school counselor apparently in charge of making the decision of whether parents are told anything about it or not if their kids are going to make life-altering decisions about their gender identity. You know, that's scary because a lot of times these things lead to some pretty invasive medical decisions down the road. Yeah, that's a a terrible idea to have someone else in charge of your child's entire human path. But also, I noticed in this lawsuit, they actually have an exhibit of the slides that are being used to train teachers. And it actually makes the case that it is a violation of the policy. Big deal if you, quote, out students to family. Apparently, basically trying to scare teachers who actually want to involve the parents. Here's what's also interesting. That training that you mentioned was provided by an activist group called Side by Side. Guess what? That's one of the foremost activist groups showing up in Hanover, severely pressuring the school board to adopt a more radical policy. I hate to say it, you usually find there's an agenda behind these things that crosses into all sorts of schools. It is usually not just an organic, this is what we happen to come up with. And yeah, the whole thing demonstrates why it is so vital for parents to speak up and head off the bad policy before it's actually adopted, rather than having to go through the heartache of trying to have it removed afterwards. But regardless of you know what part of the process you find yourself in, we are going to be there as the Family Foundation to stand behind these parents as they battle. That's exactly right. That's why we came up with the Protect Every Kid Initiative to stand behind parents. Um, And in that light, I think we can wrap up with more good news today for parents because a lot of this might feel pretty overwhelming. Um, But there are tools out there to help you. And one thing that's big is this new parental rights law recently signed by Governor Yunkin. Yeah, hopefully our listeners will recall us talking about this law that actually requires every public school to notify parents when sexually explicit content is going to be used in their child's classroom. And then it allows the parent to basically look at that material, and if it's not appropriate for their child, they can actually request an alternative. So what's now going to happen is that every single school district in the state has a deadline of January 1st to implement this at their local level. And we are ready to rumble, ready to come alongside you as parents with our Protect Every Kid resources and really just help parents hold their school boards accountable to this new standard in this law. Yeah, I actually wanted to highlight just a few things that are in these guidelines that the Virginia Department of Education has made available to these school boards that will really help parents. You know, first of all, it has a pretty clear definition of what is sexually explicit under the Code of Virginia. So a good definition there, and it can actually apply, and that's important to pictures, photographs, videos, things even on the computer. We know everybody's on the computer, so that's important. Then it makes clear that it applies to, quote, instructional materials content used by one or more students for an educational purpose, regardless of the format. So this means that it can apply to online materials, movies, digital resources. And if library materials are going to be used in the actual instructional material, it can apply to them too in that context. And I think the last piece is really important because we've seen this with family life education opt-out situations, is that it can't be implemented in a way that makes the kid feel singled out or punished as if it's a big deal that they're being given this separate assignment. Yeah, parents, this is definitely an opportunity that you want to make sure your school board implements. These are some great tools for parents to be respected when it comes to what their kids are exposed to at school. And I will mention that our policy team is going to be helping parents suggest to schools specific ways 
that principals can put into place the protocol for making sure this happens, making sure the information gets available to parents, and that they have plenty of time to review it in advance. Well, it's that time again. Time for our Inconceivable Moments Award. This is where we're featuring examples of the absolute lunacy and craziness that happens when cultural leaders try to give guidance completely apart from biblical principles. And we're calling this the Liberals' Most Inconceivable Moments Award. Inconceivable! Whatever happened to the good old days of no child left behind? Because apparently now your child can be left behind if they live in Washington, D.C. and aren't vaccinated. Yeah, when we were prepping for this show, there was still this little situation where kids in D.C. could be forced to leave their school if they elect not to get the COVID-19 vaccinations. The D.C. mayor basically gave unvaccinated students an ultimatum. They either had a few weeks to get through the vaccination series and this deadline, or they were going to be kicked out of school. And keep in mind, this is they're not giving them any virtual options. This isn't like go home and be educated on the computer. This is just go home. It's actually pretty disturbing when you consider the fact that nearly 50% of the black children in the district ages 12 to 15 had not gotten the vaccination. And this was all happening right around the same time that we were seeing these national headlines that kids' academic test scores all across the country were plummeting. They had plummeted because of having to drop out due to COVID in the first place. And this is really hitting the ethnic communities hard. Yeah, I think we've definitely seen that those that were saying kids need to be in school, the scores are proving that out. And now, of course, we've got the situation that government officials would then force more, especially black kids, because their reading scores are worse in that situation, to stay home against their parents' will. And, of course, it also makes perfect sense to deny our own citizens an education at the same time that the school district is proudly opening its doors to people who entered the country illegally. Now, I, I want to say we have compassion on people who are trying to flee difficult situations in their countries. And we do want all kids to have an education, but you just got to recognize there's something wrong or broken with a system that denies an education to its own citizens and then opens it up simultaneously to others at taxpayer expense that haven't gone through correct documentation. Yeah, I mean, I think it is worth noting and pointing out that the U.S. Department of Education's website has actually has on it like a statement that says you cannot deny kids public education due to their citizenship or immigration status. Apparently, a huge unwritten exception to that, though, is vaccination. Yeah, and Victoria, you were pointing out, where's the whole equity in all of this? Yeah, it's definitely an equity issue. And I can't help but think D.C., with all this craziness, somehow they still at least have a little school choice. I'm just comparing it to, I'm sitting here going, this is craziness, but yet at least they have a lottery system. You can go to a charter school. We don't even have that. We don't even have that in in Richmond. Yeah, it's a mess. I don't get it. All right. Well, before this aired, I did hear they were trying to extend the deadline for D.C. students on these vaccines. So we hope that happens. But it still doesn't respect the overall issue, you know, of basic freedom for parents who want to make individual medical decisions for their own kid. So I think we are going to give today's inconceivable award to the D.C. school district and the city, you know, Washington, D.C., for their leave every child without a vaccination behind policy. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.